Well, good morning. Please sit down. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Glad you're here. Uh, for those new to us, my name is Leighton. I serve on the staff team here as a lead pastor. I want to thank uh, Brooke and Jeff, and I want to thank uh, Ference for our, their, our large worship team this morning. Uh, so Brooke is actually filling in for someone who's sick, and the rest of the team is either sick or away, so they're here. And uh, just a little story about Ference. We had to pull him off the injured reserve list. I don't know if you knew this, he actually had a heart attack just one month ago when he was awaiting surgery. And so he came in, and uh, so we want to pray that that surgery happens quicker because he actually does need that. So, so thank you, everyone, that, that was up here leading us. And Ference, I never heard him sing until this morning. He actually has a very, very good voice, so that's, that's fantastic. <clears throat> okay, so speaking of singing, just a few announcements. So first of all, Kids Church, uh, if you're here, you can sneak off to your Kids Church right now. Uh, that's uh, age, I think, four to grade five, so you can just sneak away. I see Ashlyn back there with you. So tonight is our, our monthly uh, night of worship, and if you've never been to one of our night of worships, they're excellent. So uh, last time we had this, almost as many people were around, and we were able to worship God and pray. It's a very different atmosphere than what we have on a Sunday morning, and so I would say if you haven't been out to one, you should maybe come tonight. So 6.30 here in the worship center. Operation Christmas Child deadline is today. And so we see some boxes over here, and we want to pray and thank God for those that they will continue to, to uh, show the light of Jesus to, to people in different parts of the world. But if you forgot to be, participate in this and you still want to, no problem. Just pick up a box today. You can drop it off here at the church before uh, end of tomorrow, or else just take it directly to Forest Grove Church. I think they're the, the center that's uh, collecting all the boxes there. Another way to show your generosity is through our very own House for All Nations. They have something called Winter Clothing for Kids campaign. And that is uh, coming up on Wednesday, this Wednesday, the 16th. And so what they're asking is for you, if you have young families, to go through your, your clothes and see if there's any winter clothing that you know, you, doesn't fit anymore and you can take it over there. So they're on Avenue W, and you can just drop it off directly at House for All Nations. Uh, someone first service said, I've knit some mitts. They're brand new. Can I bring those? I go, yeah, you can. You can even probably donate some money or go buy some new stuff too. So if you want to participate, that would be a great way to, of doing that. And it would bless the, that community as well. Uh, Pastor Will, sitting over there, he wanted me to remind parents of junior high and senior high that you have a meeting this Tuesday, Wednesday night. So Tuesday for junior high parents, 7.45 to 8.45 p.m. in the chapel. And then Wednesday for senior high, same time and same place. Uh, Steve Bell is coming to Ebenezer. How many people have been to a Steve Bell concert before? Okay, so not quite as many as the first service. Uh, Steve Bell is, is a great musician, and he's a great storyteller. 
And when you come to a Steve Bell concert, you walk away feeling incredibly blessed. And so I would encourage you, I don't know about you, but um, over this last season, we haven't got out very much. And so my wife and I went to Tim and the Glory Boys a couple of weeks ago. That was so much fun to be able to get out and just to enjoy music and singing and other people. So we're hosting it December 11th, so um, the tickets are available um, at the office and the information is on our website. Okay, another thing coming up really quickly here is December 18th. It's our All Congregation uh, Prairie Land Center celebration. And that's on December the 18th. Now, I brought a picture of the last time we were gathered together. That was back in 2019. And so uh, some of you that are, are new don't really know all of who we are. And, and even those people that are here, sometimes we only see the people in the room. So it was fun to watch people walk in and then see all our congregations, all five of them gathered together in one place. And so we are, we're going to start off with a uh, service and then we're going to end up eating together a brunch meal. And so we need you to sign up for this event. This is our only service for that day on, on December 18th. So next week, we're going to make it very simple. You can go to the website right now and do that. But next week, we're going to have a QR code, code uh, on the screen and also throughout the building. And you just um, zip that QR code and you go to the, to the place where you sign up. And if you know you're coming, sign up earlier rather than later so we can get our numbers for that. So I think that's the main announcements. The other one I just wanted to mention is that, as you know, Pastor Wes's father passed away this past week. And so the funeral is going to be held right here at Ebenezer on Friday at 2 p.m. And I know that some of you want to know the times and, and the place for that. If you are willing to help out with either bringing some baking or serving at the funeral, just let us know at the office. So Darla's back there or Tracy, you can let any one of them know today even. And we want to honor uh, Chet and his family. Okay, so let's, uh, let's bow our heads in, in prayer. And one of the prayers that we hope that you pray personally as we gather is just, just a simple prayer, God, would you speak to me today? And you can pray that prayer, whether, whether or not you're someone who is um, of faith, new to faith, pursuing faith, because God honors that prayer, because he can speak to us. And so just pray that, and then I will lead us in a prayer on behalf of our church. Let's pray together. So, Father in heaven, um, I pray that you would speak to me today. And I pray that you would speak to us because you are the true God. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You are the source of strength. You are our rock and our savior and our stronghold. God, we thank you that you are the one who gives encouragement. You're the one who opens our spiritual eyes. You're the one who is great and awesome in power. You're the one who provides for us. You're our helper, and you're our comforter in sorrow. And so, so God, even as we come today, we just say thank you for being our Father in heaven, the one who is holy. And Jesus, uh, you're God. You are God in the flesh, called the Ancient of Days, which means that you always existed and you always will. Thank you, Jesus, that you are not only, not only the author of our faith, but you're the perfecter of our faith. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the holy and righteous one. You are the image of the invisible God. You are the indescribable gift. You are the head of the church, the light of life, and the Lord of lords. And today, uh, Jesus, we want to uh, bow before you and worship you and thank you for all that you did by coming to this earth, that you lived the perfect life, and that your sacrifice was worthy, that allows us to be in the presence of God today. And Holy Spirit, you're God. You are the one uh, who is the spirit of counsel and of power. You're the spirit of life. You're the spirit of truth. And you are the voice of the Lord, which means that, Holy Spirit, you're the one who convicts us of sin. You're the one who opens our eyes to Scripture. Whether we're new to faith or whether we're looking into the Word deeply, you just... Um, Reveal the scriptures to us that, so that we can understand what it means in this day and age. And Holy Spirit, you're the one who guides us into all truth. And so even today, we know that you're present with us, but we ask, God, that you would now spread yourself across this room and that you would open our spiritual eyes and open our hearts so that we might see and receive and open our minds so we might understand. And so we thank you for that. And then, God, thank you that you're a God that loves us and you hear our prayers and you care deeply about uh, every nuance of our life. So today I want to pray for a few things. I want to pray for our youth. 
And I ask God that you would continue to, to guide them in this world that's teaching them all sorts of things. And I pray that you would empower people like uh, pastors Will and Ashlyn as they teach and the sponsors as they teach, that the word of God would come alive in our youth's lives and they would know the difference between false and true. I pray for the, our college students and thank you for their love for you and for their desire to know you and may you make them a light on campus this year. I pray for our, our families, uh, every stage of that family and especially the marriages in that. God, that you would guard the hearts of the spouses, that they would be uh, seeking after you and loving the other person. And Father, may you strengthen our marriages so we can provide that strong foundation as a family. I pray for those that are single, either by chance or by choice, and that you would continue to bless them. Uh, for those that, that are longing to find someone to be a life partner, I pray that you would give them patience in that journey and that you would bring the right people into their path. Uh, for those that are content in their signal, singleness, I pray that you would just affirm them and that you would be their Lord and, and the person who they rely on in their life. Father, I pray for those who are, are grieving, and especially I want to pray for the Ingram family. I know this is, a, um, this is a, a tough time for them as they prepare to say goodbye to their dad, and I pray that you would just uh, guide them in every way as they meet together as a family, as they remember Larry. Father, we pray for uh, those that are sick, and I know that we have a number of people. There's Tracy Younger, who's recovering from heart surgery in Edmonton. There's Ferenc behind me who is awaiting heart surgery, and I pray that you would open the doors so that might happen quickly and safely. And many other people, God, that are, are struggling with significant health concerns or significant um, relationship concerns or significant mental health concerns. And you know us intimately, God, and you know what we need. And so thank you that when we pray to you, you hear and answer our prayers. And so guide us now, I pray, and I pray that you would be with uh, Pastor Wes as he comes to share. I pray that you would put your hand of anointing upon him, that it would come with power, and that you would give us ears to hear. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to invite the ushers to come forward at this time. And uh, just a, a couple of things. Uh, some people have asked me, why are you bringing the offering back? And uh, we, we don't have to because you've been so faithful in giving, but we, we're doing this for a few reasons. Number one is because um, our offering is really an act of worship. And so we want to come before the Lord and we want to give him in many ways our praises, our prayers, and also our finances. And another reason on, on a personal level, I remember uh, when I was growing up and how important it was for me to see my parents contribute to the offering. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but uh, my, we used to fight over who got to put the envelope in the offering plate. And, and it taught us as kids that, first of all, that what we have comes from God, and so we honor him back. And it taught us to be generous as, as people. And so when that's void, and I know we're giving, but but the people around us don't see that we're giving. And so that's why we, we brought back the offering. So why don't we, as the offering plate is passed, and it's passed, most people will stand and will sing one more song. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God Okay. 
is running after me. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after me. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome to Ebenezer. It is a blessing to be with you this morning. Whether you're joining us in person or you're joining us online, it is good to be together. My name is Wes Hodgson, and I have the privilege of being a part of the staff team here, and it's just a joy and a privilege to be able to open up God's Word with you. And so I would just ask before we move into studying the Scriptures together, would you join me in prayer over our time together? Father, we thank you for your presence here in this place. We thank you that you are with us. And God, we desire to hear from you this morning. We need your word. You, you say, Jesus, in the scriptures, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so, Father, we tune our hearts to your word this morning, not to the word of any preacher, but we turn our hearts to your word. Father, I ask in your kindness and in your mercy that you would place your anointing upon me as we go through the scriptures, that that which is of you would bear fruit in our lives and draw us closer to your son, Jesus, and that which is just of me would fall to the ground and just be forgotten. But Lord, we ask that you would do this and draw us near to yourself for the sake of your honor and your glory. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be continuing on in our series looking at the book of 1 Timothy, which we're calling How Stuff Works. The letter of 1 Timothy is a letter from the Apostle Paul to one of his apprentices, Timothy, and he is giving him a crash course in leadership and on how to lead a complex congregation in the midst of a difficult circumstances. And so this book is incredibly timely and relevant to us always because it's God's Word, but it's, particular, uh, it's particularly important for us as we navigate changes on the horizon for us here at Ebenezer. This morning, we're, um, before we jump into the text, I want to just highlight verse 15 for us of our passage this morning. Verse 15, Paul writes this. He says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, and there are lots of pressures that are happening in the Ephesian church at this time. Last week, we looked at how there was pressure on the outside of the church. Ephesus was a bustling metropolitan city on the edge of Asia Minor, which is kind of modern-day Turkey, and it was a port city, so it was a major economic hub for the region. But at the same time, it was also a place where spiritual pilgrims would come, and they would come to worship and to offer sacrifices at the temple of Artemis or Diana, the Greek goddess of fertility. And so Ephesus itself was a difficult climate to try and pastor a church in. 
But there were not only pressures outside of the church, there were pressures within as well. There was a difficulty with false teachers beginning to rise up and teach false doctrine that was causing confusion and division within the community. And then on top of that, Timothy was likely facing his own pressures inside of himself. As a young and likely insecure, reserved, maybe even a reluctant leader, he was commissioned by the Apostle Paul to stay in Ephesus and to set this church set this church straight. And again, this is not exactly the easiest of tasks. And when I read verse 15, I can can almost imagine the Apostle Paul wanting to, to come alongside his young apprentice and say to Timothy, you need to keep the main thing the main thing. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is how this works. You can't get distracted or discouraged by everything else that's going on around you. You need to keep the good news in front of you always. This is how this works. And so this morning, we're going to look at how Paul wants to keep the good news of Jesus central as Timothy moves forward in his ministry. So let's pick up where we left off. In verses 3 through 7 of chapter 1, Pastor Cal looked at how these teachers in Ephesus, they were beginning to teach false doctrine. They were devoting themselves to secondary things in the law of Moses. And they were teaching, and what it was doing, it was, it was, it was leading to controversial and meaningless talk. It wasn't developing the life of love that the gospel truly produces. It was only making trouble and division. And so Paul continues in his line of thinking in verse 8, and he says this, We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Clearly, these false teachers were mishandling the Old Testament. And whether they were doing so just because they were unaware, or they were doing it blatantly, trying to teach things that were false, whatever the problem was, the mishandling of the Old Testament was the issue. And so the question for us today in this verse is simply this, what is the proper way then to handle the Old Testament? Do we, as New Testament followers of Jesus, do we just dismiss the Old Testament completely because we have Jesus now? Do we we need that? Or do we try to keep every letter of the law succinctly as perfectly as we can in the Old? Is that how we need to handle it? And Paul writes about this extensively in the book of Romans, and we don't have time to go through all of, or a survey of all of Romans, but I'm just going to direct our attention to a few passages. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Paul writes this. He says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. The law's job was not to show you a list and say, do everything on this list and then you'll be right with God. It was a way of showing God's righteousness and His holiness and at the exact same time to kind of create an awareness that we're never going to live up to this. We are sinful, broken people. Psalm 15 verse 1 and 2 say it this way. The psalmist says, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? Who, who, can, who can actually be with you and live with you? And the psalmist answers, the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart. Now, can we be honest for a moment? Can, any, can, can this describe any of us? If we're being sincere, can this describe any of who we are? Is there any one of us whose walk is perfectly blameless, never having done anything wrong? Does any of us answer truthfully all the time perfectly? And obviously the answer to that is no. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. We use the law properly when we allow it to reveal God's righteousness and to show us our sinfulness. This is how we use the law properly, but there is another way in which we use the law properly. Jump back with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, 21 and 22 say this, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. 
This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. God gifts us his righteousness when we trust in his son, Jesus Christ. But what's amazing about this passage is that Paul actually says, the law and the prophets testify to this reality. In other words, he's saying, we know that God gave the law, we know that God gave the prophets, but even within the law, we know and we understand that there's no way we can keep this. There's no way we can actually hold to this standard. And the law and the prophets, they testify to that in and of themselves. So what this does is it reveals to us that we need a savior. We need a savior. Hebrews 10 verse 1 explains it this way. Hebrews 10, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. When you see a shadow on a wall, the point is not to focus on the shadow. The point is to focus on what is causing that shadow. This is what the law is doing. It is pointing to the reality that God is righteous, that we are sinful, and that we desperately need a Savior. We use the law properly when we allow it to reveal God's righteousness, to show us our sinfulness, and to point to our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is how we need to use the Old Testament properly. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, when he's interacting with the Pharisees, he says, you diligently search the scriptures because you think that in them you will have eternal life, but you don't recognize that all of these scriptures point to me. All of these scriptures point to me. This is how we need to use the law properly. And now as we continue in our passage, Paul, in no uncertain terms, he's very clear, he's going to say and he's going to outline exactly who it is who needs this Savior, Jesus. He outlines one group in verses 9 through 11, and then he outlines another group in verses 12 and 13. So let's look at each of those. Verses 9 through 11 say this. We also know that the law is not made for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill mothers and fathers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Sometimes in our sin, it could just go in the category of rebellion. That's a good word for it. It's just a stubborn refusal to accept God's will or to accept God's ways on a matter. And Paul has many lists like this throughout the New Testament. I just want to show you one of them in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Paul writes this, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I remember reading this as a 16-year-old kid, this passage in particular, my family, we grew up kind of nominally Christian until my mother came to a, a genuine faith in Christ when I was about 12 or 13. And at that time, I received a Bible, and so for the next few years, I kind of would skim and read it at times or whatever. And, and there was this one night that I was reading in Galatians 5, and I was reading this particular passage. And this, the, the passage that jumped out at to me was where Paul mentions drunkenness. And it just it stuck out to me like a sore thumb because at that point in my life, I was in the party scene. I was just living it up with my friends, engaging in that kind of behavior. And I remember literally reading this passage. I remember looking at the Bible as Paul was speaking to me through Galatians and it just, the word drunkenness just leapt off the page. And I remember to myself going, oh boy, and this is what I did. I slammed it shut, and I put it on my bedside table, and I said, I don't want to hear it. 
And I remember doing this in my mind, thinking to myself, I don't want to hear it. I'm enjoying my life very much right now. Thank you very much. I'm going to keep living how I want to live. And I remember I stuck it on my bedside table and I just ignored it. Now, but at the same time, I knew through reading this, this wasn't the life that God had for me. Sometimes our sin is just rebellion. It's just an unwillingness, a stubbornness to accept God's will and embrace God's ways. Now, sometimes like me, our sin, like that example, sometimes our sin is very clear. It's very obvious. We know exactly what we are doing. We just don't want to follow God's will on a matter. Other times, though, we're just, we're ignorant. We don't actually know. Paul mentions this a little bit further in verse 12. He says, I acted in ignorance and unbelief. There are sometimes, maybe if you weren't brought up in the ways of Jesus, you didn't, you just literally didn't know. It's like, oh, I, that was a sin? I, I didn't know. And there's, sometimes there's just things where there's a lot of unlearning that needs to happen. But whatever it is, whether it is ignorance or whether you know full well what you're doing and you just don't want to follow God's ways, rebellion is just that. It is saying, no, I'm going to do this my way. And there's a whole list of things that we could engage this on, whether that's dealing with authority above us in our lives, how we deal with coworkers and neighbors, how we handle our sexuality, how we deal with our money. Whatever the case is, God has a path on a matter. He has a way in which he wants us as his followers to engage in, and it's our job and responsibility to trust him in that, to yield ourselves to that, but sometimes we just don't. Sometimes we just look at what I did when I was a teenager. I read it plain as day, and it was like, yep, no thank you. Do my best Frank Sinatra impression. I did it my way, right? And I just, you don't want to do it. I just want to do my own thing. Sometimes our sin is like that, but not all the time. And this is where Paul gets a little more personal with his young apprentice, Timothy. Verses 12 and 13, he writes this. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Before Paul was the apostle Paul, he was a Jewish leader named Saul. And Leighton shared a little bit more of his story a few weeks ago, how he violently opposed the church in its infancy until he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. And Paul goes into a little bit more of his personal story in Philippians 3 where he says this, Philippians 3, 4, and 6. If someone else thinks that they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul here is citing his religious credentials and accomplishments. And that's at that time, that was his crowning achievement. He had done it. He says, of the law, I'm faultless. He actually believed in his, in his mind, I've kept the law. I've actually done it. I've actually accomplished this. But now in light of Jesus, everything, all of that accomplishment, that's just a pile of garbage to him. It's nothing compared to what he has now. Because you see, for Saul, before he became Paul, his religious life was everything. It was his devotion and his commitment and his religious observance that was the centerpiece of his life. He thought to himself, I'm worshiping God, but in reality, he was worshiping his own devotion. He was worshiping his own commitment to the cause. Sometimes our sin is rebellion, but sometimes it's religious. Sometimes our sin is religious. And see, for some of you, you could totally relate to my story, right, of just kind of a willful rebellion. I know what the sin is. I just don't care. I'm going to do my thing. But for others of you, maybe it's Paul's story that you can relate to. Because for some people, religion becomes their savior, 
They work extremely hard to present a good, clean image. They keep all the rules. They try to keep all the standards. And while there is an outward appearance of righteousness, inwardly they never actually learn to trust God. They never actually learn to rest in God. They never actually learn to put their hope and their trust in Him because it's all about them and what they can accomplish. And what makes religion so terrible is that it never, actually, it never actually gives you the rest that it promises. It only leads to one of two things. On the one hand, it leads to pride, right? On the one hand, it leads to pride. You do all the things. You check all of the boxes. You keep all of the standards. You do everything that you're supposed to do. And then you sit back and you go, hey, I did it. I've accomplished it, and what, what happens is not genuine righteousness, what happens is self-righteousness. You become arrogant and smug, and you think to yourself, well, I'm better than everybody else, because I kept the rules. I played, I played in the bounds, and nobody else did, and that's why I'm righteous. And no, that's self-righteousness, and it's not the way it is. So that's the one thing that religion leads to. The other thing it leads to is despair. Because if you play the religious game, what ends up happening is you try to keep the standards. You try to do everything right. You try to keep the rules as best as you possibly can. But then what happens is you inevitably fail. You inevitably fall short. You inevitably, like, you succumb to temptation or whatever it is. And then you're sucked into this cycle of shame and guilt and despair because it's all on you. You have to make this work and you can't. And this is what's so, th th this religion can't save us. It can't save us. And neither can rebellion save us. It is only Jesus who can save us. Religion can't make the cut because we're, we're not righteous enough in and of ourselves. And rebellion is not going to lead you to the life God has for you either. It is in Jesus that we have righteousness. It is in Jesus that we're made right with a holy God. And it's in Jesus that we are welcome to walk with God in this beautiful life of fellowship. It doesn't matter whether your sin is rebellion or your sin is religion. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and all of us are in that boat. He came to redeem us and to reconcile us back into relationship with the Father. That's what it's about. It's about walking with God and actually enjoying relationship with Him. This is central to the gospel, and it's central to what Jesus is trying to encourage Timothy. And Timothy, don't get off track with all of these other things. Don't get distracted or discouraged. Keep the gospel central as you move forward in your ministry. And for the rest of our time this morning, Paul is going to outline three different things that the gospel shows us. In verse 14, he says this firstly, the grace of our Lord Jesus was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The first thing the gospel shows us is God's grace. The gospel shows us God's grace. Grace is this word in the Greek, is, it's charis, and what it means is a kindness or a favor or, or a gift towards someone that does not deserve it. Grace means that God is incredibly kind to you, even though you do not deserve it at all. But did you notice what Paul says in verse 14 about how he received that grace? He says, he, God poured it out on him abundantly. I love that picture. God pouring out his grace abundantly upon Paul. Paul uses this similar language in Ephesians 1, talking about grace. He says this, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. That word lavished means to exceed the natural limits, to have more than enough, to have an excessive amount of something. Think of when you're, you're pouring something and it just begins to overflow over the cup. That's, that's what this word lavish means. Now, in the Hodgson home, we love breakfast. Okay, give us breakfast 
any meal of the day, we're, we're game for it, okay? My kids love waffles, they love crepes, they love pancakes. You think of any way to do a pancake, we have probably tried it at least once. We love it, we are all game for it. And we love the real deal maple syrup at our house too. Like, we're not buying any of the cheap stuff, we're buying real deal, 100% real maple syrup. And when my kids, they decide that they're going, we're having pancakes, if Tamara and I are not careful, they're just going to go full on Will Ferrell and Elf on that thing. And they're just going to open that sucker wide and just dump it all out. And we're just going to be like, oh, like, that, that bottle costs like $70. Like, it's, like, it's crazy right now. Like, you got to chill out like easy on the syrup, right? Because it's going to be half gone if we're not careful. I love this movie too, by the way. Like, this scene is hilarious. She looks at Elf and she's, you really like your sugar, huh? Is there sugar in syrup? Yeah, uh-huh, then yes. <laughs> He's just so excited about the sugar. Anyway, it's a great movie, but anyway. I share that with us jokingly, but all kidding aside, this is the way that God gives us grace. This is the way that he does it. God is not stingy with his kindness, and he's not cheap with his favor towards us. He's just not. Think about the story of the prodigal son. The son comes home after having blown his entire inheritance. He winds up broke and homeless and starving, and he runs back to his father thinking, I'm going to have to beg, but who cares? I'm starving to death. And he goes home to the father, and what does he get? He gets a father that's running towards him. And the father puts a robe around him and puts sandals on his feet and he embraces him and he he gives him a ring and he says, welcome back to the family. All the the authority that the family has, I'm giving it to you once again. And he, he throws a party and he kills the fattened calf and it's just this huge celebration. It is excessive. It is excessive and that's the way the father is with his grace towards all of us. Or think about Paul. Paul was once a persecutor of the church. He was once trying to destroy the church. And yet, once God got through to him with his grace, he looks at Paul and he says, Yep, you were once persecuting the church. Now you're going to plant them. (laughs) You were once persecuting the church. Now you will plant them. Because I'm going to get, my grace is coming for you. This is how he does it. And, and Paul, he, he reiterates this in verse 12. He think, just go back to verse 12. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord. He has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Could you imagine Paul for a moment looking at these communities of faith? And he's looking at the eyes of some of these people and he's saying like, I, I dragged some of your family members off to jail. Like I was there approving their execution and now God has considered me trustworthy to preach the gospel and to to start these new communities of faith. Like God is outlandish with his grace. It wasn't enough for God to be like, yeah, yeah, Paul, we'll save you. Go over to the sidelines, please. You did some really messed up stuff. No. God says, no, we're going to save Paul. And once I get through with my grace, he's going to plant churches. Like God's grace is so incredible. It's outlandish. He just, he lavishes it. He's not cheap with it. He pours it out abundantly because that's how he does it. But he continues on in verse 15 and 16. He says this, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that reason, I was shown mercy. The second thing that the gospel shows us is God's mercy. The gospel shows us God's mercy. Mercy is defined as the quality of showing compassion or pity towards someone who is in need. And throughout the scriptures, mercy is often linked to forgiveness or withholding judgment towards someone who is, in fact, guilty. So while grace is about extending kindness that you do not deserve, mercy is about not receiving the punishment or the consequence or the discipline that you actually do deserve. 
That's what mercy is about. And in the book of Micah, the prophet helps us see more of who God is in relation to his mercy. Micah 7, 18 says this, Who is a God like you? who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance, you do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. That word delight means to take pleasure in, to be pleased with, or to enjoy doing something. God delights in showing mercy. He is excited when he gets to show mercy. He is happy and joyful and excited when he gets to pour out his forgiveness. This is what, it, this is what the word delight means. He delights in showing mercy. Now, I don't know about you, but a lot of times I can be pretty reluctant to show mercy. Someone has hurt me, someone has offended me, I have been wronged legitimately, and I know I need to forgive someone, but I'm usually not psyched about it. (laughs) I'm usually not like, yes, I get to show mercy to this person, I get to forgive them, this is going to be so great. No, usually I'm ticked, because I've been hurt, I've been wounded, this like, this hurts me. Now I will forgive, but at the same time, am I like psyched about it? Not really. (laughs) It's hard. It's painful. It's like, yes, I'm going to do this. And usually the feelings of joy come later and the, the release comes later because there's, there's joy in walking in God's ways. But am I psyched about it? Not really. But that's not how God is. That's not how God is. He is delighted when he gets to show mercy. He is joyful when he gets to show mercy compassion and forgiveness it's who he is first john 1 9 says this if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness god is waiting for us to confess our sins to just own up where we've made mistakes where we've got it wrong where we've blown it we just, he's just waiting for us to own up we're like would you would you just admit that you're wrong <laughs> just admit that you screwed this up and i'm i'm right here I'm right here waiting to forgive you. I'm right here waiting to show you mercy. You don't have to grovel. You don't have to do penance. You don't have to, you don't have to go through some elaborate. Just come. Just come and say you're sorry. Just come and admit it. I'm, I'm right here waiting to forgive you. And this is the God, the, the gospel displays God's mercy. And you might say to yourself, well, that's all well and good, Wes, but you don't know how I've missed the mark. You don't know how I've screwed up. And you're right, I don't know. I don't know how you've blown it, but I know how Paul did it. I know how Paul screwed up, and when he looks at his old life, he says, I'm the worst. I'm the worst of sinners. When Paul looked back on his old life as Saul, a self-righteous, arrogant, violent man who persecuted the church, he looks at himself and he says, there is nobody lower than me. And yet it was for that exact reason, the scripture says, for that exact reason that God showed him mercy. It was for that reason God said, I'm going to show this man mercy so that when anybody looks at his life and they look at what they've done, they can say to themselves, well, if God forgave Paul for what he did, then he can forgive me for what I did. He, his life is now an example, a living testimony to say there is nothing you have done that God cannot forgive. If he showed mercy to Paul, he can show mercy to you. But there's one more thing that the gospel shows us in the rest of verse 16. Verse 16 says this, But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and have eternal life. The third thing the gospel shows us is God's patience. The gospel shows us God's patience. Lots of times in the world that we are living in, we can look at everything that is going on around us, everything that is happening, and we can say to ourselves, like, like, God, what are you doing? 
What is happening out there? Are you not aware of how dark it's getting out there? Are you not aware of how crazy this world is getting? When are you coming back and just set this whole thing straight? Like, it's getting harder and harder. When are you coming back? When are you going to make this all right again? And in the book of 2 Peter, the apostle has some interesting words to that question, that line of thinking. Because those are real questions that we all have. But in 2 Peter 3, he says this, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. We are prone to forget this, by the way. Do not forget this, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Why doesn't God just come back already and set this whole thing right and straight? Because he's patient. Because he's patient. He does not desire that any should perish, but that everyone would come to repentance We do not and we cannot claim that we understand all of how God's timing works. We simply need to trust that he is good and that the waiting is not in vain. There is a purpose to his delay that we cannot fully see yet. And in the meantime, while we wait, we wait with an understanding that God is patient and he's merciful and he's not longing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance and come into that right relationship with God. I'm going to ask the worship team if they would come forward to lead us in our closing song. But as they come, I want to encourage you. It doesn't matter what you have done, whether your sin is the sin of rebellion or your sin is the sin of religion. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and all of us are there. And God is waiting for you. He is waiting for all of us when we turn to him to extend us grace to extend to us mercy, and to extend to us patience. All we have to do is turn towards him. And while we take this last moment to sing praises to the Lord, we're going to have staff up front. If there's anything that you need prayer for or would like to pray with someone, or if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus and you want to make that decision today, you need to set things straight with God, we would be more than happy to pray with you and to help you in that process. Or if you just need someone to to pray alongside of you, there'll be staff up here at the front. You're more than welcome to come. But let me pray as our worship team leads us. Father, we thank you for your good news. We thank you for your good news that that shows us your grace and your mercy and your patience. And we thank you, God, that this good news is good news for our eternity, but it is also good news for today. That right now, God, we can begin living in your grace. We can begin living in your mercy. And we can begin living in your patience. And God, I pray for all of us that this would ring true in our hearts and in our spirits. That we would become the kind of gracious and merciful and patient people to the world around us that is so lacking in all of these things, God. Show us your way in this, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as the worship team leads us in our closing song?
would invite you to remain standing for the benediction. But while I do that, I just want to encourage you again. We have a night of prayer and worship that will be happening tonight here in the worship center at 6.30. You're all invited to come, and it's just a great time to intentionally pause our hearts and our schedules before the Lord and just seek him together. So I invite you to, to that. Let me read the benediction over to you, which is just verse 17 of our passage today. Now to the King eternal, immortal, and invisible, the only God. To him be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Blessings to you and to your families. May you have a great rest of your Sunday, and we look forward to seeing you throughout the week or next Sunday. Blessings to you. Mm -hmm.